So in previous videos, we have already looked at the dark secrets lying just under the surface in both the school and the cabin, but today we're going to delve just a little bit deeper into the madness that is the Little Nightmares 2 hospital. So a couple of content warnings for this video. First of all, there's going to be spoilers for all of the Little Nightmares franchise. So if you want to avoid spoilers, you probably want to avoid this video. But today's video is also going to discuss some topics that some viewers might find just a little bit uncomfortable. And while nothing in this video is going to be graphic, we're just going to be looking at things that are shown in the game and we're going to be discussing those topics. I do understand that some people might not want to watch content on YouTube that has that kind of topic. Those topics are going to be depression, mental health and suicide. So if you want to avoid that kind of content, please feel free to skip this video. There's been plenty of other theory videos on the channel. And I just want to say, if you are somebody who is struggling, please don't feel like you can't reach out. Reaching out is always better than not. But this is just your warning. If you want to avoid that kind of content, this is your opportunity to do so. Like the rest of the game's locations, the hospital is already a dark, creepy and twisted place. But if you start looking just a little bit more closely, you can see that the developers have left us a bunch of clues as to what might have happened here before Mono and Six arrived. In this video, I'm going to give some theories on what happened here, including why this picture right here might just be one of the most important pictures in this entire game. The first thing I want to try and explain are the patients. The patients are the mini enemies of the hospital, and if you've played the game, you'll be very familiar with them. They seem to be made primarily of prosthetics, some missing several limbs, and some are even missing entire heads, but somehow they seem to be able to move around freely as long as the light isn't touching them. This really reminds me of the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who, which is in my opinion still the best episode ever made. While it was hard to make out at first, the majority of the patients seem to have human torsos, but prosthetic limbs and heads. We get a loose explanation of this with their official description. The patients cannot live with themselves, they look in the mirror and hate what stares back. Seeing nothing but the flaws and ugliness of nature, they beg the doctor to fix them, to work his magic and to make them whole again. So they beg the doctor to fix them. This could be a reference to plastic surgery, and if we think about the TV theme of the game, this makes sense. The viewers watch the TV shows, they see the perfect people thanks to makeup and special effects, and then they go to see the doctor so he can make them just as perfect as the people on the TV. What makes this just a little bit more sinister is how most of these patients are missing all of their limbs. How did they lose them? Did they offer them to the doctor to replace or did they lose them some other way? It's possible that some people lost them as the city falls to pieces around them, getting limbs caught in the crumbling buildings, or is something else entirely going on? One thing I noticed after a few playthroughs of this area is that you can see a progression of the hospital ward that could give us a hint as to something dark and twisted happening. The first patients you see, aside from the missing limbs and the ability to move without heads, are pretty much normal patients. They can be seen in beds, walking around the ward, and some are even arranged around a television. But as we go further into the hospital, we see a number of patients that are locked in cells. This is clearly an asylum ward, and the patients have been locked up like many patients with mental health disorders used to be before the field of psychology really took off. We can also see this electric chair here, which was also a very early and very ineffective way to treat a variety of mental health disorders. After a little more progression, you end up in the hospital's morgue. Now this is where things started to get in just a little bit creepier. Look at how many bodies are in this morgue. This morgue is overflowing, so much so that some bodies don't even get put into the chillers. This all got my brain juices flowing. Why are the morgues so full? What happened to all of these people? Well, there are a couple of possible explanations. The first is that the doctor killed them, for use in his experiments which we'll come back to later. Or maybe the doctor is just keeping the bodies rather than disposing of them. But I think there is another explanation as to why there is a surplus of bodies in this morgue. The plague of suicide that hit the world of Little Nightmares. In one of the very first rooms in Little Nightmares 1, we see the Hanging Man. Many theories were made about this guy, but it seems to be he committed suicide at some point due to the nature of his death and the note at his feet. Some people think that this man is Mono or the Thin Man. I don't, but that's a theory for another video. But go back to the description of the patients. They cannot live with themselves. Perhaps that is a more literal clue than it first appears. We see this theme a lot more in Little Nightmares 2. There are a couple more people who have clearly hanged themselves, and then there is this incredibly memorable moment where we see a number of people lined up on the roof, stepping off one after the other. Something clearly seems to be driving people to want to end their own lives. We could theorize that these are people who are using their last few ounces of humanity to be free of the Signal Tower spell, or maybe the evil entity that I theorize is behind every dark thing in this world is driving them to their doom so they can be consumed like everything else. But either way, it seems like there are far more deaths that occur here in a usual city, even of a city of this size. We also don't know exactly how long this has been going on for, but if we assume the timeline of the Pale City's downfall follows the years it took Mono to grow up inside of the Signal Tower, it's entirely possible that the Pale City fell to the Signal over a number of years. I think the Signal began corrupting, weakly at first, but grew over time. We have more evidence for this that I will explore in the dark secrets of the Pale City, but it's entirely possible that the morgue began to get filled up over time. As the Signal Tower took more and more of a hold over the city, the more and more the residents began to fall. Now as I said earlier, it seems like the patients 
are coming to the doctor to be made whole again, which seems like a reference to the fact that he's replacing their limbs with prosthetics. But this doctor also seems to have a keen interest in psychology and neuroscience. In the x-ray room, which is oddly placed next to a children's playroom, we can see this image on the wall a couple of times. This is a CT scan of a human brain, and at first glance seems like a normal thing you might see in a hospital, but after a closer inspection of this image, it could be the key to understanding exactly what is going on with both the viewers and the guests from the first game. You see, this area of darkness here indicates damage. When a brain area gets damaged, usually through injury or most commonly through a stroke, it leaves an area of damaged brain that shows up on a CT scan like this. Finally, my psychology degree with heavy emphasis on neuroscience is coming in handy. I tried to pinpoint exactly which location in the brain this image is showing, which is not easy at all. We can see that this is a top-down view of the brain, these two orb-shaped things here being the patient's eyes. We can also tell that this is a fairly far down the brain, or more accurately, it's a more medial structure, one that goes deeper into the brain. Because even seeing the eyes on the CT scan means you are more towards the middle of the brain. Look at these images. They are laid out in order of bottom of the brain to top of the brain. Imagine each one is a horizontal slice. You can see the eyes eventually disappear on these images as you get higher with the scanner. So we can clearly see that this is an area in the frontal cortex, which is an area of the brain that deals with complex activities such as decision making and social cues. It seems to be a central part of this structure from the scan. So we do know a rough estimation of what area here is damaged, although it's not exact. Now, a huge caveat, even with my psychology degree and experience, this is not an easy area to pinpoint from this one image, but the area that I think this could be is the cingulate gyrus. Now, I will spare you the research. Trust me, psychology is fascinating, but psychological research is often long and very complicated, often very dry, far too boring for a YouTube video. But if we look at this area in the most basic of terms, we can see that it has a role in a number of behaviors. Behaviors such as regulating aggressive behavior, depression, maternal bonding, and finally, drug and alcohol abuse and eating disorders. My theory here is that the signal tower, which we know has the ability to warp and corrupt physical things, has slowly, over time, been damaging people's brain structure. This would absolutely explain why the guests in the first game marched themselves happily towards the moor. It explains why people all over the world of Little Nightmares are ending their own lives, and it would absolutely explain why the enemies of these games react so aggressively towards Six, Mono, and apparently any other humans. So this would explain why the guests in the first game cannot stop eating, and it would also explain why the asylum side of the hospital is so full, and perhaps this is what the doctor was trying to cure with that horrific electric chair that we saw earlier. Now the doctor himself is probably the most difficult character in this game to figure out. He's so ambiguous and there are so many different theories as to what kind of doctor he was before the corruption, but we can see evidence that he had at least one major breakthrough in medical science. If you look at this photo, this is a symposium, essentially an IRL Zoom call for doctors before the internet was invented. This was how doctors would share their breakthroughs. They would show it in person to as many other doctors who would listen, and often these would take place in schools or universities and were kind of a big deal in the medical field. Imagine being a doctor and hearing that another doctor in another state or country had just figured out the cure to something that could cure a bunch of your patients. Wouldn't you want to know that knowledge too? So what exactly was that breakthrough? Well, the obvious answer would be the prosthetics. Maybe this doctor was the first to develop them. Them. But what if it goes deeper than that? We can see that this doctor has a readily available stash of corpses and a readily available stash of prosthetics. We also see that this patient appears to be on some form of crude life support, which some people think this is Janitor aka Roger, which while possible, he does seem to have short legs like Roger. He doesn't seem to have long arms, which doesn't rule out that it isn't Roger, but I'm not sure that it is. Another reason why I don't believe this is Roger is that when you turn off the life support for this patient and it lifts its head up, you can see this little thing coming out of the back of its head. Now, this isn't really explained in the game, but if we look at the artwork for Little Nightmares 2, you can see this concept art of people with almost like umbilical cords coming out of their brains and latching into the TV. It's interesting that we see this behind the sheet, but we can't really see it any better than that. And I think this could also explain what was happening to some of these patients and why a lot of them seem to have bandages around their heads. So isn't this thing just a little bit Frankensteinian? It's possible that this doctor was not only reattaching limbs, it's possible that he was the one removing them in the first place. Let's read the doctor's official description. Perfection is important to the doctor and he will not allow anything to interfere with his life's work. He's not trying to save humans anymore, he's trying to create the perfect human. 
There is a key scene that I think that proves this. Just before we meet the patient on the life support, we can see the doctor taking this patient and hacking them with a saw. We can also see the doctor repeatedly remove and reattach this one's head. It's almost like he's experimenting on them, seeing what works and what doesn't. It's almost like he's done this before. If we combine this with the fact that he has all of these masks, it looks like the doctor is trying to create something here rather than fix. A lot of people have theorized that these masks are what the Doctor is making to cover up the viewers' faces. The viewers' faces, after all, are all twisted and warped, and maybe these people want a normal face again and the Doctor is creating that for them. And this is entirely possible, but we know that once the viewers are corrupted enough, they will get absorbed or consumed by the television. So either these are people that haven't fully been corrupted yet, maybe they haven't managed to get to the stage of a viewer yet. Maybe this is people that have watched the TV and been warped somewhat, but haven't. Maybe these are people that have left the City. Maybe these are people that have thrown their televisions away and don't watch them anymore. But either way, it's possible that these masks are to cover up those faces. But it's also possible that this doctor is trying to create a whole perfect human being from scratch, or mainly from scratch. We can see more evidence of this. There are a number of bloodstains around parts of the hospital, including ones like this, which hint at them being done by scissors. Now, sure, a hospital is going to have blood as procedures are going to be carried out, but it's unlikely that it would have been carried out here in this corridor. This looks more like a struggle to me. We also see it splashed up the wall when you pick up the flashlight and someone even drew an eye in it. That's not something that a normal doctor would do. What gets even more dark here though, is if you look closely at the number of bottles lying around the hospital, a number of them are poison. The skull and crossbones, while it might sound a little bit cartoonish, this is actually a real thing. A lot of poisonous substances have this symbol on them to show that they are poisonous, to stop accidents happening. So why are these lying around the hospital everywhere? Did the doctor deliberately kill his patients so that he had access to more bodies to experiment on, trying to figure out exactly how to bring people back to life, or bringing them to life from scratch? This would explain so much. The Doctor who started off innocently trying to help those who had lost limbs in this world slowly started to get corrupted by the TV signal. Moving on to trying to reanimate corpses of the dead and even killing living patients in order to create his twisted version of a perfect TV show human. Another creepy little occurrence that I don't think I've seen anybody make the connection of yet is that you can see this picture in this child's room and it seems to be the picture of one of the children we see in the Little Nightmares 2 comics and the Little Nightmares 2 artwork. What's really interesting about this child is he seems to be missing a limb. You see that he has his arm poking out on this side, but not on this side. Is it possible that this child was a patient of the doctor, but he managed to somehow survive? Maybe he was a patient of the doctor before the doctor became corrupted by the signal tower, but it's definitely a clear connection here. And this child has definitely been a patient in this hospital since we can see his picture in here. But either way, it's interesting to see that this child has been at the hospital at some point. We just don't know when. Another thing I want to point out, in a previous video I spoke about this bathtub full of something that I thought could be tentacles in an homage to Lovecraft's work. Some of you think it could be leeches, others thinking it's eels, and I've even heard one person say they think it's soap. Well, once again, the official artwork gives us more evidence here. We can see in the school that there are smaller versions of these in a glass jar in the teacher's room. They look very similar and are exactly the same colour. If we look closely at this artwork, you can clearly see this creature in the jar that has very obvious tentacles. Why is it not as obvious in the game? Well, maybe the devs changed their mind, or maybe they decided to bury the secret just a little bit more deeply. But either way, tentacles, padded cell, big hints to Lovecraft in my opinion. I also couldn't leave this room out since so many of you in the comments have spoken about it. We can see the room the girl in the comic ended up in here. The tunnel she dug through in, however, is now infested with incredibly hungry rats. If you give them the cheese, you can get an achievement and you can hear them devouring the cheese very quickly. What's more interesting about this though? Rats are very often used in psychological research. Their brains and behaviors often manipulated to test theories on human behavior. Could there be a connection here? Maybe, but regardless, it's a cool little Easter egg. So those have been just some of the dark secrets of the hospital. I may have to come back to the artwork of this place in a future video though, since there is so much more to dissect there. Okay, enough puns. If you've enjoyed this video, I have loads more theories on the channel and much more horror content. Go give it a watch if you want to. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.